this intro to BioAnth course, it's an interactive hands-on four credit lab course. And one of the things that I think um, kind of makes it unique in this way is that students go to these weekly labs and the point of the labs is both to learn the scientific method, but specifically in the BioAnth concept. And so um, most of the labs we have, students explore hands-on analysis of you know skulls and skeletal material in the labs it's been really great because i'm able to incorporate a lot of active engaged learning practices um, a lot of peer teaching and that's been one of the best things about lab is i'll walk around and students work in groups and i encourage them to try to come up with the solutions as a group and then i can when they struggle i'll, I'll step in and answer questions um, and but statistically over the years they've really learned a lot more, I think, through that peer teaching than just having me um, kind of lecturing to them. And so because they do weekly labs, they end up with these frequent, fairly low stakes learning checks um, that have really been helpful in supportive uh, learning of those concepts. And so this recent project that I took on all came about as much of our, our work has been um, with in response to the onset of COVID when it required this rapid shift um, to try to meet those same course goals, but in an online setting. So what we did was um, even in the fall and the spring now, I've been doing face-to-face -face lectures with an online virtual lab component. And so in today's mini lesson, I'm gonna talk about how one of those specific subsets that we did in, in this lesson on how to identify um, primate behaviors and look at the ways that primates are unique among other animals um, while showing you how I've implemented some of these engaged virtual analysis techniques. Once we're looking at that taxonomic structure, what is it that actually separates primates from other orders? Looking at the reasons that primates evolved the traits they did, there's two major driving factors that sort of prompted that evolution. The first um, being the emergence of angiosperms about 125 million years ago. Um, and angiosperms, as you can see in that image on the top, are just fruiting flowering plants. But they, re they represent a really massive change in the food sources available in these niches. Um, at that time, 125 million years ago, in that these are high caloric dense foods. If you think about any type of um, fruits that you consume today compared to lettuces that you would eat in their salad, that's basically the diet difference that we have as we shifted from salad to fruit. And so that's gonna allow any organisms living at the time, again, to capitalize on those food sources in their diet. And then the extinction of dinosaurs that opened up these new niches around 65 million years ago for primates to really take over. And so because of those factors, we have primates that emerged right around 65 million years ago, and they have these set of characteristics that tend to be common across the entire order. Um, and we believe that these characteristics reflect this shared ancestry as they evolved to arboreal settings. So they evolved to life in the trees. And so we look at these tendencies um, that we refer to as homologies or specific traits that represent a shared ancestry in this arboreal heritage um, and show that life in the trees required they adapt these physical sets of characteristics. So the first characteristic, one of the major ones, is grasping hands and feet. The flexibility and dexterity that we have in our hands um, is something that other primates have, or non-human primates have, in both their hands and feet. And we also have what we refer to as opposable thumbs. And opposable thumbs is just the ability um, for you to touch all of your other fingers with your thumb and gives you that full rounded gripping ability. Um, and here you can see some examples of the opposable thumb. Grasping is really important in primates because it's one of the things that allow them to learn. And we'll talk in a little bit about the importance of learning in primates. Primate infants are able to automatically grasp things that are put in their hand. You see this with human babies. If you just, even a newborn, if you rest your finger in the palm of their hand, their hand will naturally close around it. So while human babies don't grasp onto the fur of their mothers the same way that non-human primates do, um, we still do retain that grasping ability from infancy. For primates, this is really critical because starting from that young age, young are then able to go and, gonna be able to travel around with their mothers wherever their mothers go to learn all of those um, critical behavioral characteristics. Another thing that's unique to primates is our hand sensitivity. And here in class, I always, um, I do kind of a, a little exercise. If anyone happens to have like a purse or a bag around you, I ask students to close their eyes and reach into their bag. And we have a race to see who can be the first one without looking to pull out a pen from their bag. And you're able to do that because of that sensitivity in your fingertips. We can feel, you know, if you grab a pen, even without looking at it, I can tell the texture of that through that sensitive skin in my fingers. This is something that's really unique to primates that, we, again, we don't see outside of the primate order. 
because of that way that we're able to experience our world via touch in addition to our other senses. Another thing about our hands that's different is that we have fingernails instead of claws. And so again, this is going to contribute to that flexibility and dexterity of being able to use our hands in more um, kind of delicate and minute activities. Another major characteristic that is unique to primates is our stereoscopic vision or three dimensional vision. Um, if you think about life in the trees, it is really critical to know how far away that next branch that you're trying to jump to is um, to be able to assess that distance. And so primates have this specific feature because our eyes have have moved and are centered in the front of our head. What this does is it creates the um, overlapping views of vision, and this is what's going to give us that depth perception. Um, if you compare this to animals that have eyes that are located on the sides of their heads where they don't have that overlap in vision causes a blind spot. And so in this um, binocular vision perspective, you can see a horse, for instance, has a much greater range of peripheral vision, but they lose that depth perception. And in some cases, the peripheral vision is helpful. So if you think about animals that don't have some of these other characteristics, they need to be able to see more on the side to see if a predator is coming. Whereas in primates, we've developed other features that allow us to outsmart predators, and we don't rely on that peripheral vision as much. Related to that depth perception, there are other animals that live in the trees that don't have that overlapping vision. Squirrels are one example, and as a you know, demonstration of how important this is, you may have heard or noticed squirrels somewhat frequently falling out of trees to the ground. Um, because they don't have that depth perception, they're not quite as agile in those arboreal settings as primates are. And they also don't have those grasping hands to help them cling onto branches when they land. Um, another thing that we see in primates is a reduction in the sense of smell. Smell is not nearly as important for primates, again, because of our reliance on these other characteristics. And so we might not be able to, uh, you know, we have we have some sense of smell, obviously, and so we can smell critical things. We can smell smoke um, if we know there's fire we need to flee from. We can smell rotten food, and that tells us, you know, that indicates, hey, don't don't eat this thing. It's moldy or it's rancid because of the smell. But we can't smell if there's a predator coming 30 feet away um, in the way that other non-primate animals can. And so it's this development of eyesight and touch and then our intelligence that helped us overcome that need for smell. Again, um, my students love to point out the exceptions. So we do have baboons who do have, who do retain that longer extended muzzle. Um, but we really think this is due to dentition more than anything else. And um, later on in the semester, we talk about the evolution of primate dentition and the massive canines that baboons retain. Another really critical key that differentiates primates from other orders is their having color vision. If you are an herbivore or you are um, a frugivore and you're trying to find berries among trees, it can be really difficult to figure out where that food is without that color vision to help elucidate that for you. Another difference about primates is going to be our dentition. Primates have what we call generalized dentition um, or heterodontic dentition, meaning they have different types of teeth that serve different functions. Um, we have incisors for ripping things apart, canines, out of context uh, for primates, canines are more social, um, and other animals, canines can be used for hunting, and then premolars and molars for grinding food. Um, so then some other non-morphological characteristics, a few, there's a few more primate tendencies that are going to relate more specifically to increased intelligence. Intelligence we just define as the ability of an organism to acquire, store, retrieve, and process information. Again, while there's some more nuance to this, in general, the larger an individual's brain, the more space they're going to have to make these neural connections responsible for this data processing. And so in primates, we tend to see larger brains in relation to our body sizes. And these brains are going to be more complex and have um, more parts to them that help expand those intelligence capabilities. There's also going to be specific changes in the brain itself. So in primates, there's an increase in the neocortex or the portion of the brain that is believed to be concerned with memory and thought. In primates, the reason this is significant is primates develop a much more kind of intimate relationship with their landscape. They have these mental maps of where they know they can get food, um, where they'll seasonally return to certain areas in environments where you've got seasonal food chains. So things like those fruiting plants, if they know when, when trees are going to flower, when those fruits are going to be around, they'll move around and, and go back to those same spaces over time. 
Um, the other thing that I do want to reiterate is that it is um, the ratio of a brain size to a body size is significant and in primates that's a larger ratio than in most other animals. So if you do think about you know a whales and dolphins have larger animals than humans but their brain to body ratio is smaller and so they don't have as high of a level of intelligence as primates do because we have larger brains um, this emphasis on intelligence is going to shift with the job role of parents or of parenting is in primates and so because we rely more on intelligence and learned behaviors there's going to be a lot more emphasis on parental teaching you have to teach your young how to do things that might be innate in other species related to that primates also have single births where we um, typically will give birth to one young at a time this allows parents to devote more time to the development of that young again the exceptions that students love. There are a couple of species of New World monkeys that do regularly give birth to twins, um, but again, this is not super common among the whole order in general. And in humans, we have seen exceptions to this as well, but typically these exceptions are the result of medical intervention that allow um, birth in greater numbers to occur. Next up, we do also this intelligence is going to lead to a longer period of dependency, and so primate babies compared to babies of other orders of animals are relatively useless. Um, they're adorable, but beyond that, because their brains take so long to mature, there is very little they are born innately being able to do. Primate maturation rates are also going to be much longer than other non-primates. This loosely correlates to body size, and so the smaller the adult primates, the quicker the babies mature. So in species like our lemurs and lorises and tarsiers, um, a lot of those the lorises and tarsiers specifically can be, you know, some species no much, not much bigger than the palm of your hand. Um, they tend to reach maturity by about one year. In our monkey species, monkey babies tend to reach maturity by about three or four years old. In our apes, however, chimps and gorillas often don't reach their physical maturity until about eight or nine, and then humans have the longest infant dependency or maturation rates. Um, and so this relates to learning as well. During this long period of dependency, primates learn everything they do from their parents. This opens them up to social ability. So not just do they learn those physical behaviors, they learn how to act. They learn the different components of what it means to be a member of that species. In gorillas, they learn the social hierarchy of who you need to respect as the alpha male and what those different divisions are. Um, most primates tend to live in complex social groups and primate children learn the rules for living in those groups through these other various increased tech, uh, intelligence and other um, differences that we've looked at. And so here's just a couple examples of that social ability. These are all cases where primates are learning, uh, or most of these are learning tool use. So among this bottom left image there, you can see a chimp teaching a baby chimp how to crack open nuts with a rock. Same thing in the second image on the top, we have some New World monkeys who also will use rocks to access um, other food. Down in the bottom middle, we have some, it looks like baboons who are teaching some young how to eat different food types. Um, and then in the top right is primates who are grooming each other, and that's a, a really social trait. So uh, what I would like to do now is just take a really quick minute and ask you all to do a quick lab activity. So, um, but what I would like you to do is go to this course website. If you go to this labs dropdown and click on lab number five, modern primate anatomy. And then this is just an example of one of the labs that would have gone with this lesson that we did today. But if you could go down to exercise two and look at these four mystery skulls, you can you know, zoom in and out, rotate them, explore them a little bit and see if based on today's lesson and looking at those skulls, see if you can answer any of this table and figure out whether the species that you're looking at are primates or not. So is the first one a trick question <laughs> the one on the upper left? Yeah, so you got it. That one is the tricky one. That's that's the baboon skull. And um, that's the one that, you know, we do spend more time talking about it in real class. But um, so in baboons, because they've got those huge canine teeth is part of the reason why scientists think they retain that longer snout. That one is a dog. I think that's actually a pit bull. Um, and so, yeah, if you look at the teeth too, and you can see even from the side, it's got all those really long, they're kind of pointier uniform teeth types. That one is a tree shrew. Huh. So it's a, it's a rodent. Um, in, in class, students get really confused about this. We didn't cover this today, but 
there's um, the lemurs and lorises and all the prosimians have, if you look at that third one, you can see it does have, like the eye is closed in with a bar around it, but it, there's not bone it all the way in the back. And there are some primates that have that. So they have that, that bar that'll go around the eye socket, but it's not solid bone like in humans. How about the last one? Anyone know what species that last one is? Gorilla? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Good job. I was like, it looks human-ish, but not human. Yeah. Which is also what we love to, uh, when students make that identification in class too, and they're like, it does, it looks a lot like we do. I'm like, exactly. That's, <laughs> we're talking about humate primate similarities. Most of the one, actually all of the ones here, um, these are 3D scans of the actual skulls that we have in the classroom. Um, and so that was our goal was, you know, when we asked this question of, well, how can we make as close to the same experience as possible? And my first thought was, well, if we can use the same materials, um, you know, that's one way to keep it consistent. Obviously, there are some things we can't. And so in this web, this lab website that I've made, some of the other labs, I've also been able to pull this website Sketchfab is where I upload and do all the editing. Um, and there's other people who have accounts on Sketchfab who upload materials they have. And so in that way, we've been able to scan our stuff, but also incorporate some other material that we might not have in our lab. So in that way, we've been able to kind of expand beyond our regular confines. And so one of the other things I, I did, if you look at the that lab drop down, um, like when you clicked in to click on lab five, the other stations are there then too. And so I tried to mimic in the lab room, we have each table is a different station. So here I just made a tab for each station. So they get that same kind of progression through the, the lab development.